I'm Doug. Oh, I'm Malcolm. Lovely to meet you, Malcolm. Thank you. Malcolm, could you tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, like when you were born, etc., before the war? Yes, I was born at Stratford upon Avon in 1930. Then my father, he was an artistic decorator and he worked for an Italian firm in Birmingham, so we moved to Birmingham. Unfortunately, my father had contacted uh, TB, he called it galloping consumption, and he died very rapidly. Uh, I think I was about 10 months old, so I never knew my father. Um, my mother, of course, had to go out to work then to look after me and support me, which meant that we lived with my grandparents and uh, my grandmother more or less brought me up, and particularly during the war period. I was with her all the time because my mother was in the ARP, the Air Raid Precautions. Can you tell us a little bit about your mother before the war, please? Yes. She, um, she joined the ARP, which was the Air Raid Precautions, uh, which was uh, formed in 1938. Uh, this was in case there was ever an emergency and there was bombing. They wanted to be prepared, have people trained in looking after first aid and that. And my mother uh, was a good driver. She used to drive, so she volunteered to be an ambulance driver. And they were given this badge when they joined, which says ARP. Uh, my mother was particularly proud of this, this badge because all those who were conscripted in after the war started, they didn't have these which had a silver hallmark on. And she always said that you could always tell those who volunteered from those who were conscripted. And she was always proud of her badge. In fact, her uniform to start with consisted of this badge, a steel helmet, a gas mask, and they got this yellow armband uh, which said, simply said, Air Raid Warden, and that was their uniform at the outbreak of war. Um, I believe you brought some memorabilia with, with you. Could you show us the uh, Air Raid Warden's arm badge, please? Although it said Air Raid Warden, obviously she was an ambulance driver, but it helped them to be identified in case of an emergency. You've got a photograph of your mother as well, haven't you? This particular photograph she, she had taken and she only had one copy of it done, and she gave it to me. She didn't tell me beforehand, but she said, I'm, I've had this taken in case I get killed. And you bought these in Malcolm. Can you explain to me what these are about, please? Yes, certainly. At the start of the war, they were known as the ARP, and they had this ARP in red on their uniform, which consisted of that type of outfit. Later on, they changed the name to the Civil Defence and they went from red to gold and she got an uh, ambulance on her on a arm, at the top of her arm. And that is a photograph of the Civil Defence uniform. How did her life change when war broke out in uh, September 1939? Well, it, it started for our family on the 1st of September when the Germans invaded Poland. My mother was working in the city and when she went into work she was summoned to the manager's office and she wondered what she'd done wrong. <laughs> anyway, when she got into the office he told her that he was going to come with her. She got a clearer desk and uh, take all her personal belongings home and got a report to the ARP depot. He said, uh, take all your personal things with you because you will not be coming back. Right. Uh, what did she have to do? Well, when she came home, she, uh, my grandmother was surprised to see her, but she assured her she hadn't had the sack, but she told her that she got a report to Court Road, ARP Depot, number 16, I've remembered the number, <laughs> uh, which was by the side of Spark Hill the Fire Station. It was a public works uh, centre yes. there. And of course there was Spark Hill Police Station yes. there, and next to it was the swimming baths. Right. Now I mentioned the swimming baths because they were very important in the war. Um, they used them as a first aid casualty stations. Right. 
I'd always remember at Spark Hill that it, it, there are a lot of steps up into the building yes, yes. and they put a lot of sandbags round it, right. locked the entrance and there were two entrances there and there was a large sign, one said female and the other one said male right. and the idea was that if there was a gas attack they would take the casualties in either side right. because they got these baths in there right. and uh, decontaminate them in the, the baths. Yes, um, yes, wash you've got to remember in those days we didn't have bathrooms no. so a lot of people went to the swimming baths and paid to go in a, a, a private bath to clean themselves. Yes, yes. Um, Malcolm, if you were born in 1930, that would make you nine when the war started, um, were you evacuated? Um, no, I couldn't be evacuated because, you see, having contacted the TB in my body, um, I had to have my left leg put in a, a leg iron we called a caliper, and this was to isolate the TB germs which were floating around my body, because had they got to my lungs, I, I would have died. Uh, so I had to have a private education. The alternative was to go to what they called the Royal the cripples school for cripples right. and although my grandmother went with me to see the school that by cripples it wasn't people with deformities with legs it was people who were affected in the mind as right. well yes. and she thought that was an undesirable place for me to be yes. Yes. so she decided to get me into a private school right. now being in a private school we didn't come under the Birmingham Education Committee right. so we couldn't be evacuated it has to be done privately. And I remember we, I reported back to school on the Monday after the war was declared, and the headmistress sent us all home because we'd got to have a shelter built. <laughs> well, I think if my grandmother had found out that uh, the shelter consisted of a brick wall in front of one of the classroom right. windows, I don't think she'd have sent me back. <laughs> but, uh, it, we went back to school on the Wednesday. However, on the, that Monday, as I had nothing else to do, I went and got a shovel, a small hand shovel, and went up to Spark Hill, uh, well, the fire station, where, by the side of where my mother's ARP depot, and there was a big pile of sand, and I joined other schoolboys in filling sandbags, and there was the, the firemen were busy tying them up. So, you know, that was my contribution to the war <laughs> efforts. Um, and later, uh, shortly after that, <coughs> I went with my grandmother to meet my mother off duty from the, uh, by the side of the fire station, and they got all these requisition vehicles uh, to convert them into ambulances. Uh, can you explain to me what you mean by a requisitioned vehicle? Well, a requisition vehicle meant that the government had powers to take a vehicle off a, a company and use it for its own purposes. And I always remember this one vehicle was Fillory's Toffees. Right. It had a beautiful royal blue on the surround yes. and it got gold and red lettering on it. Yes. And of course they spotted it by putting a huge red cross oh. on the sides <laughs> and on the roof and uh, they contained four stretchers. Right. Um, Incidentally, all the ambulances which were later built for the, that purpose, they all carried four casualties. And I always remember my mother telling me that they had this code that if they got four casualties, or more than one, yes. and one died on the way to hospital, right. the ambulance attendant would just say to her, where are we, Clarice? What time is it? And that was, she would know then that someone had died and they could log it when they got back. Right. Yes. Fortunately, my mother didn't have anyone die in any of her ambulances. Right. She had one lad who was very seriously ill and he died just after they got to hospital. Right. And my mother found his fountain pen in the ambulance afterwards and she sent it to his mother and his mother sent it back to her and asked her to keep right. it. Yes. Um, I think I still got that at home somewhere. I never threw it away. Um, the air raids began in the August of 1940, I believe. What was it like to be um, alive then, living through an air raid? Well, I can well remember it because uh, I was had to go to bed with my caliper on 
my leg iron. Um, in those days, I, I used to have it taken off for sleeping, but with the air raids possible, and to keep it on, otherwise there wouldn't be time to put it on. So I had that to uh, get my caliper on in bed, but they'd wake me up if it was sort of late after I'd got to bed when the raid started. And as soon as the air raid sirens went, we had about 10 minutes to get to shelter before you heard the drone of the aircraft. And you could always tell that they were German aircraft because of the sound of the engines. Right. And there were two sounds. One went something like this. And the other one, that, it's either a Heinkel or a Dornian, I don't know which way around it is now. But the other one went zoom, 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 zoom. Right. You know, a different pace. Right. But uh, if they were ours, it was a continual drone with us. So yes. during daylight, we could tell if it was a German aircraft. Right. In fact, I was going back to school from lunch one one day, and I heard this zoom, zoom, right. and no sirens had gone. So when I got to school, I said to the headmistress, there's a jerry overhead, we used to call it jerry. Yeah. Well. I said, there's a jerry overhead. And she said, oh no, you're mistaken. She said, the sirens haven't gone. At that moment, the sirens sounded. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to live through the bombing? Well, it was rather exciting for a young lad. <laughs> yeah. um, the problem for us was that we hadn't got an air raid shelter. Now, we were given the opportunity of having an Anderson shelter. They were called Anderson shelter because the Home Secretary of the day was Sir John Anderson and he was responsible for the Anderson shelters. Just afterwards, Herbert Morrison became Home Secretary and uh, he developed um, an internal uh, one which they called the Morrison shelter, which was like a, an iron table with mesh sides, so you got under the table and debris would not uh, injure you if it fell on the table. Right. Um, <coughs> anyway, we didn't have one because, <coughs> excuse me, Grandad didn't think that the Germans would reach as far as right. Birmingham. Yeah. <coughs> so when the raid started, we had, the alternative was a public shelter, which usually was be under a, a row of shops. In the, they knock the walls out of the cellars of shops right. and they go right round the corner, in fact, in right. Stony Lane, right. Spark Brook, where I live. Right. Um, or there was the Brewer's Arms public house opposite. Yes. And they said we could always go down their cellar, yeah. which I did quite most of my time in their cellar. And then sometimes I paid, we got pubs on every corner in Sparkbrook. Yes. And there was the Lion and Lamb just down the corner. And they had a lad the same age as me. And every now and again, they wanted me to go and play with him. So we'd play there. And if the sirens went, we went down into their cellar. Yes. Anyway, <clears throat> we didn't always get down to the Brewer's Arms cellar. My grandmother used to take me to the one on the corner of Stony Lane. And on the, and this one particular night, the, we got in the shelter and it was absolutely crammed with people. So we hung about him and she said, oh, we'll, we'll go home and, and try and get in another shelter. And the air raid warden responsible for the shelter was on the listen now. And he said, well, it's gone a little bit quiet now. He said, if you want to go out now, go now. So we went out and we got home and our neighbours had got an, a little Anderson shelter, which there were only two of them and he worked nights. So two weeks they were in it, two weeks they weren't. Right. Because she went to her mother's if she'd run around. <laughs> yes. And we were hoping that they weren't <coughs> in the shelter. <clears throat> anyway, we were going, my granddad was a master baker, he got his own bakery, right. and we were walking through the, the, the bakehouse when suddenly I heard them coming over and I heard not the scream of a whistle right. where they tried to terrorise us, but I heard the whoosh of air and I yelled to my grandmother to, to drop on the floor. We both hit the deck. And first there was one swish and then another and then these mighty explosions they were and it literally lifted me up off the floor right. and bounced me down and I shook sideways and for the first time I really thought I was going to die. It was the most scary moment that was. Right. And then when it, when it was a slight lull we got up, we got down the shelter. But that was my, I suppose the nearest I came to being killed 
because those bombs must have dropped within about 50 yards of where we were yeah. because the, having a building all around us saved us from the blast. Yes. If we'd been out in the street, we might have been killed by yes. the blast. Yes. Um, the, so we, we got down that shelter. But the funny thing was that the very first air raid, I slept through it. <laughs> um, and it was fortunate that I did because we'd been out, gone into this neighbour's shelter that night and there was a bed in there and I'd gone to sleep and then suddenly my grandmother woke me up to, to say come on the radio and I woke up and it was all like daylight yes. and it was all red in the sky right. and apparently they dropped bombs all round us right. and one had hit a gas main near right. Stony Lane and of course it was a beacon for the, the Luftwaffe that come yes, in yes. and the, the firemen couldn't put the, it out otherwise everyone would be gassed yes, yes. See, so they had to let it burn and of course they started bombing all around there. And I never, I slept all through it. My grandmother said, well, when the bombs were coming down, I threw myself over you. Yes. And of course it muffled all the sounds, so I slept through it. Yes. And I was disappointed because I slept through it. But I mean, afterwards, of course, I began to appreciate how, how serious it was. And the, the big thing was when the raid started, was the anti-aircraft defences. We, we were in a good area for that. And what we had over Birmingham, I think, I read that there were over 90 anti-aircraft guns covering Birmingham. Usually they were in batteries of four. Right. And we had one battery not far from this school in, right. in Swanto's Park. Right. And where the fire station is, the Bilton fire station is now, in that corner were all the huts where the soldiers had their of quarters. Oh, and the guns were in a line just down, going down the hill from behind where right. the fire station is. Now, there was another battery in Victoria Park, Small Heath, and there was another battery at the Robin Hood Golf Course. Right. So I would imagine those 12 guns would concentrate on one area, right. and they called it a box barrage. Right. The idea was not to shoot the German planes down, but to make them fly higher above the barrage. Right. And um, that was effective, but in case there were any dive bombers, we had the balloon barrage right. where they'd be in parks and big houses in the back yes. gardens yes. and they'd be going up to about a cable of about 500 feet right. which would be adequate for any dive bombing you see. Um, but we always listened to the anti-aircraft guns and it, that was a reassuring to us. Yes. Yes. And obviously there were more guns around that area but I wasn't sure where they were located. But to, to hear the scream of the bombs the Germans thought it would terrorise the people, yes. but it didn't. Instead of terrorising us, it told us as I hit the deck and everybody took cover. So they were, you know, it had a, an adverse effect in the Germans. Yes. Um, Malcolm, I think one of the famous raids in Birmingham was uh, occurred in October 1940 when the Carlton Cinema was bombed. Can you, and your mother was um, involved with that. Can you tell us about it? Please? I can because um, it's a date I will always remember. It was the 25th of October. And uh, obviously I was in the shelter with my grandmother that night. But when my mother came off duty the next morning, she came into the house and she was very subdued. And, she put her gas mask and her helmet on the table and she sat down on a chair and burst into tears. Oh, it was terrible, that was. And anyway, after we calmed her down, she said, they got the Carlton last night. And she said, I went into the, the dark building, because the roof was blown off, right. so the moonlight was shining through, and she saw all the people sitting there and she went up to speak to them and suddenly realised they were all dead right. from the blast. And they got their eyes open looking up at the screen. Right. Her attendant was so overcome that she collapsed. And they had to send a dispatch rider to uh, Court Road Depot to get a relief right. attendant before my mother could remove any of the, the casualties. So um, she, she never talked about it after that day. Right. Never mentioned it again. But uh, after the war, they, they cleared the site, and we recently, there was a memorial garden put there, which I've got some photographs. 
Baron, the Birmingham Air Race uh, Remembrance Association, we we went and participated in this uh, opening ceremony for this memorial garden. And uh, it was a privilege for me because I knew that my mother had been there to help with the, sick, the injured. Mark, I can see that's really upset you, but um, can I thank you from, from my point of view and from the school's point of view for coming in today. I've really enjoyed talking to you, so thank you so much. Well, well it's been a privilege to come and I hope that some people will get benefit from that to realise that war is not a thing to be glamorised at all. There is always a lot of suffering. Thank you.